So okay, I, I can start recording. So don't forget. Yeah, I, uh, we will start in a minute or so, but I will just tell, uh, remind people that we have actually a number of uh, talks for the spring. So like in about a month, we have Frank De Mayo who's talking about the Rosetta fold all atoms, and then Sergey of Shinikov and Patrick Bryant they are going to talk about how to modify the inputs of a folder by examining the outputs. They have both done uh, basically ways that you can try to optimize the MSA by uh, from the output of alpha fold. And I think that's going to be interesting. And then we have Janine Durari, who's going to talk about protein lag and complex prediction. And then Frank Nui is going to talk about something we don't know yet. I uh, he promised most likely something about uh, potentials. And then Cecilia Clementi is going to talk about machine learning for potentials also. So it's going to be a full spring. And then I think we're going to have a break during summer because it's CASP season. And uh, I realized it was a bit hard to organize the summer. But if someone wants to do something there, it's fine. And uh, yeah, just with that short reminder, I think we can ask Philip to start talking. Mm -hmm. about uh, uh, machine learning methods for the Nova protein and peptide design. So, uh, let's yeah. see what I'm, uh, I think you should it. be able to share the screen just. Yeah. Let's see, let's move. Uh, working. Now, yes, that looks good to me. And there are still people dropping in, so you don't have to stress. Hey, yeah, got, but there are some. <clears throat> okay, one second. Okay, um, should we should we get going or um? Yeah, go go ahead. I think man, people are, I anyway, mean, the frequency of people dropping in has decreased, so I think it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, no worries. Uh, okay, well, I'll get started then. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation, uh, Arne. And um, um, I'm happy to to share a bit uh, of of our work uh, with with this great audience. I think uh, I uh, I don't think I've been to a cast before, actually, if if I recall correctly. But uh, I would I would certainly like to come in person at some point to to cast. Um, all right, and I'll tell you a bit about about the work we do in both my lab and um. And you know, and I I am right now wearing wearing two hats. Um, my second hat is is you know running the machine learning portion of, of a company I started uh, about two years back. And so um, and I'll I'll share a tiny bit of of, of our work of our work at Fable Fable Therapeutics as well. Um, okay, so let's get going. Um, so um, as you as you all know, um, and you know, as I think we we all share the same excitement, right? That um, it is. It's been. It's been a very. It's been a very exciting couple of years for um, for protein structure modeling. I think in general, and uh, and and I think that that's that's largely been driven by 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 the advent of AI. And I think I think everybody knows that. Um, I think so. My my personal view is, and I think that's that's also not a very controversial view, is that um, you know we're we're all very smart and creative, but. Um, but we're but we're sort of all you know we we have all our all the success the past couple of years dependent dependent on on three things right and one thing is the, is the accumulation of data that we have over the, over the past several decades from um largely from 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 biology and then we all owe a great the a great deal of thanks to Moore's law because computers are just extremely extremely powerful right now. And then, um, and and then we're we also owe a great deal of of debt to the development of, of various sort of deep learning methodologies um, that, that that we all make use of today. And then all these three put together leads us to has led us to a number of great advances in um in the modeling of proteins. And 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 what and what I'm gonna particular gonna gonna be talking about is 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 these advances as they lead us to be able to design um. Design proteins to design binders and specifically designed to design um, protein and peptide therapeutics or biologics. Um, okay. Um, so um, what what I'm gonna what I'm gonna claim is that in terms of structure, in terms of structure-based design, there, there were a number of advances that were made over the last, you know, three, four, five years 
that uh, enable the, that that enable protein design that enable de novo biologics design and i think most importantly most important of these were these developments of um of representation of 3d structure that that enable really deep learning models and um and i think in, in initially these were graphs and I'm, I'm i'm claiming some credit for um for developing graph methods for protein design and more recently the graphs have been superseded by by these ss3 variant approaches and I'll, I'll be mentioning these in a in tiny bit as well then of course everybody likes transformers and we, 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 did, we did some work on this as well and then uh, in protein structure we want to use transfer learning and um and um, especially, in, and I'll talk about this a bit as well, in the antibody or peptide world where, where we, we live in a sort of a low data regime and we have to make use of transfer learning and there's, there's some, 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 some examples sort of out of, out, of, uh, out of my lab for that as well. And then finally, um, for sampling, um, there, there has been a bunch of development in, in the last just few years, just one or two years really, and um and one one thing that's now in everybody that's now a, almost a household name are diffusion models which are getting superseded as well and um and, and my lab produced produced uh, one of the earliest diffusion models for, for proteins as well um okay so with that and then uh, the final thing i want to note on that is that you know we're so in my lab we, we did a bunch of academic work and we've been with and, and at fable um we've been taking some of the academic work and building on top of this and sort of bring this to bigger and better things with sort of the resources we can we can do in a company, and building um, building what I would what I would say are state of the art methods, state of the art technologies to do to do um, antibody design. Okay, so um, so let me first talk about talk about graphs and talk about molecular structure and how, how do we deal with molecular structure with 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 AI with machine learning, and so um, so I, I think this is the audience probably knows this very well, right? That um, that it's it's um it's it's difficult to do things in three in three D space with traditional uh, CNN or RNN or 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 MLP type um um type neural networks simply because you know we're, we we have this problem of um of 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 different perspectives on the um. On the, on the on the three D structure, right? So so you can you can you can turn your 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 protein, or you can move your protein, and all the coordinates change. But uh, but and that's that's not something that's that's very efficient for the neural network to learn. And so the so the the earliest the early approaches to solve this were these invariant approaches, and the and the easiest to understand there are these graphs, right? And so we can we can come up with a with a basically fully bijective approach to to encode our 3D structure fully in a graph by um, by by viewing residues of nodes, and then we have we have we have different we have different features of the nodes and different features of the edges, and that gives us a a basically fully projective way to encode our 3D structure of a protein in, in a graph, and that that has the advantage of being fully rotational translation invariant, and we and we don't have to do any 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 discretization. And then we have a we have sort of a nice a nice way to to represent the protein structure in a way that's, that's very suitable for a neural network to learn, and that we can do things like like graph convolution or 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 graph transformers to do um to do to do deep learning, right? And and these were and these, these are sort of the sort of sort of the best early approaches to to deep CD structure in um in in neural networks. And I'm I'm going to mention that that now. Um, it's it's now a couple of years later, right? And now we now we live in the world of of the of the um of that the beyond graphs and 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 in particular sort of the I'm a I'm a big believer in in the SS3 equivariant transformer type approaches and uh, we're now in sort of the second and third generation of these and um and these these tend to perform better for for a variety of reasons, but but I'll but for here I'll just stick to graphs because they're easy to understand. And so the and so one of the earlier one of the earliest um 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 these protein design methods based on graphs was protein solver which we which we developed in the, all the way back in 2018 and in the, in the in the in the middle ages of of um and when when it comes to when it comes to protein AI and so a protein solver is a um protein solver is is a graph convolutional neural network that takes in the the, the protein topology as a, as a set of constraints. 
and then um, and then we, we we trained it. So so the protein topology represents the the essentially the the, the the backbone structure of the protein in question. And then we when then we trained it with on on all the structures of the PDB and also on all the all the sequences that are in the PDB. So that there are all the sequences that, that these proteins, proteins map to. And um and then we could we could then train it to essentially fill this protein backbone with a sequence of with a sequence of of of, of residues, and then we can we can show that that leads that the leads to all the proteins. And the the main thing was that we that we have these graph convolutional layers that can then lead to fixed backbone design. And we and we could see that protein solver works relatively well at um at generating sequences with a with a relatively high sequence identity to, to the reference. And we could show that um, back then we lived in the pre alpha fold world. So we so when, when we validate a protein solver, we had to we had to use these sort of pre alpha fold structure prediction methods to show that that indeed we were getting out folds from from our, from our, from the sequences that look like the the template. We could show that we, we can do that for um for all alpha all beta alpha slash beta alpha beta kind of proteins, and that that these score well in various metrics. And we could also actually take some of these proteins and um, and actually make them in the lab, and we could show that that for an all alpha protein, we're we we're, we're indeed getting an getting an, a, a CD spectra that look exactly like like the like, like the template protein. And so uh, so that, that was in 2019. That was both like really mind blowing, and we were we were really very happy, and it and it it outperformed most methods before. Of course, now it's a couple of years later, and then um. Other related approaches have now appeared that um, that 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 uh, that outperform protein solver most notably ESMIF or protein MDNN. and ESMIF is, is based on a um, on I would say a a more sophisticated um, deep learning architecture. Protein MPNN is actually conceptually quite similar to to protein solver, but but it's 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 certainly it's certainly better engineered and it and it outperforms protein solver. Um, okay, and so and then the last thing I will mention to the protein to the graph aspect is that we're at Fable, we're we're build we're building protein design methods um, or sequence design methods. We we would call it REMLM uh, or REM that um, that outperform um outperform previous methods by 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 fairly large margin by by incorporating um structure foundation mod modules that that are that operate in the global frame. So we so we we don't we don't operate in graphs and that is that equivariant. And we're we're all performing protein MPNN by, by by quite a good margin, and we are we are all performing these um, fine-tuned protein MPNN methods also by, by by healthy margin, and that enables us to design CDR sequences or so antibody H3 CDR sequences for for any for any given target epitope um, with with quite with quite good accuracy, I would say. Um, okay. So, um, so sequence design is, is, is I would say the, the, the easy task and can be can be solved by um, by, by any of these methods quite quite efficiently. Um, so the um, the more difficult task is is the noble protein design, and we can do it unconditionally or conditionally. And um, and so unconditionally would be where you just have a you just have a model that generates a backbone that will fold. So and conditionally you you have some some sort of conditional scaffold and motive or target. And then, and then you have a model that, given the condition, generates the backbone that still will will, will fold with, with the condition, right? And um, and so um, you know, everybody knows now what the fusion models are. So you know, you 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 learn the noise, or rather, or rather, in sort of the SGM context, you'll do you're learning the score, which which is which 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 is the which is the gradient of the, of the probability of the probability distribution, and um. It's actually kind of interesting, right? So, so the fusion models first appeared on the stage in 2015, which is which is quite a long time ago. But they, they sort of remain sort of a, a kind of obscure um and kind of obscure thing in, in, in generative AI for, for for most of the time. And then in 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 mid to late 2021, they started to outperform GANs. Um and and then people started to notice, and we started to notice. And so, and so then, then, then Dali, Dali came out, right? And stable diffusion came out a bit later. Um, and so, uh, and so we, we, we noticed this um, in um, you know, about 2021, sort of one of my students came to me and was like, you know, there's this new thing called diffusion. And then I, I want to use that to do, uh, to do protein design. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. But, you know, I told him basically in the, in the world we live in now, we have to, well, we'll have to do it tomorrow. We'll have to we'll have to publish it the day after tomorrow because otherwise we'll be gonna get scooped. 
and um and we we basically did that and we 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 were we were out we were out quite early so we we were we were, we were out in 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 some of 2022 so well before chroma or rf diff that came out like like about half a year later and the way the way protein sgm works and and it's um and it was the first the first sgm the first score based generative model for protein structure is that we're we take a we we take a a a graph based again representation of proteins that we can then that we can then um, represent as images. So um, so we we're, we're we're taking essentially the the TR that a representation of protein for protein backbone, which is that of distances of C, from the beta to the beta as a matrix, and then uh, and then three angles the the omega the theta and phi angles, and these are matrices, and then we have a padding matrix. And then we can take we can take these matrices and essentially train a um, a essentially off the shelf SGM that was built for images to to then um, to then train these to to generate more of these image like representations. So we were taking these from the PDB. We're training a an, an SGM then to to generate more of these images. And then we, we and then we can, can then see here already that we're, we're generating sort of these these image like um, matrices that look kind of a lot like the 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 images or the the matrices that, that come directly from the VDB, and then we can take these and then um then and then and then generate backbones and then use a sequence design method like Protein Solver or MPNN or Rosetta to to then generate a sequence that will that will fit in that backbone. And um and that worked that worked um, um surprisingly well you know as as I said so we're so we're, we're when, when we when we evaluate these with a, with a physics based function then we we are getting rosetta energies we, we are we are getting um um exclusively negative rosetta energies that that are that are sort of that have a similar distribution to to native samples on the PDB. And uh, something with, that we can do in the in the post alpha fold world is that we can we can take a, we can take a backbone from from protein SGM, generate a sequence, and then have the structure predicted with alpha fold, and then we can ask we can ask is the structure that we're predicting from the sequence that we generated, is that the same structure as it's supposed to be from from the backbone that the backbone that we generated in the first place, and the SCD, the SCDM score essentially measures the the self consistency of the of the structure that was predicted from the generated sequence to the generated backbone and when you're at like 0 0.8 0 0.9 that means that you're actually that you're basically alpha fold agrees with the with the with the so the, the structure that you generate are actually actually the structure that you wanted right so uh, so that so that so that's essentially the, the designability metric and we do we actually do quite well we do we're we're, we're we're competitive, I believe, with 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 with, with, RF Rosetta, with RF diffusion on this on this on the metric, and as most other um, as most other um, uh, diffusion models for um for, for 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 protein backbones, we are um we are somewhat um over over overrepresented of of our indices, though not not nearly as much as as other methods, and we are pro we are producing some some beta sheets. Um, and what, what I want to mention is that so we're, we're producing a range of the, of, diff, of different protein folds, and um, and we're, we are producing a number of, a bunch of protein folds that are um, that have a max TM score of uh, to the PDB of less than 0.5, so so that, that are really novel folds um, as, as as far as far as we can tell. And then I'm, I'm going to mention again that we this is all out and it was all out on our archive in in in, in July 2022. Uh, and and it was and it was quite quite kind. Uh, it was we were quite happy to see that that, that really works. No, of course, there's as many methods out there to do that. And finally, um, we then went and we did we took some of these really new novel protein folds that we generated. These are of course not 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 the most exciting ones, so the helix bundles, but but they are they are they are novel, right? So they I think they have a TM to the PDB of like 0.55 or something. And we actually made them in the lab, and we can show that they. So not only does alpha fold think that these generated proteins do fold into that thing that we we wanted them to fold into, and it's fully novel. But the but they actually are real proteins, and they are real, really, really fully folded alpha helical proteins, like like they're supposed to be. And they have a have a have a decently a decently uh, high uh, melting temperature, and they have a, they have a nice sort of a two state folding transition. So these are real well behaved proteins. They, they um they're real, and we can do all these things. Uh, we did all these things before most other people, 
with we can do domain name painting or scaffolding painting and we're, 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 get, we're getting out this this um we can do conditional generation as well so uh so, so all stuff works and i want to want to do a final shout out here for for peptides right so um so we and uh, and so now soon my lab worked on first and that was that was quite a long time. It was already some time ago. We we did helix helix GAN, so we we, we trained the GAN to generate helices based on different conditions. So we, we so we can we can generate these 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 near MHG helices, and then now uh, we generate helix helix diff a diffusion model that that does the same thing, and that that actually performs substantially better than the GAN as 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 expected, and um we can then generate D helices and we generate a DGLP one. And if everybody knows now GLP one, of course, for for Zempic, it's a hotel name by now. And we could we could generate a DGL, a DGLP one that um that that that, that indeed activates GLP one R. So not not quite as not quite as um not quite as potently as GLP one, which is quite potent. But um but the the advantage of a D of a D peptide, of course, of course, is that, that it's not going to be subject to to proteolysis in the in serum. Um. And finally, um, for for antibodies, then we we, we, can, we can build an SGM for antibodies, and we, we did that. And the the main the main novelty here is that we can um, we can do we can do sequence and structure co-design by simply um, simply adding a sequence channel to our as a as a as a one encoded matrix to our sixty matrices here, and then we can do sequence and structure co-design, and um, and we. In this sort of relatively simple model, antibody SGM, we we just edge out diff app and by by simple metrics, RMSD or or, or A3, when if when we do full H3 design, and we'll we'll put it on by our pretty soon. Um, and I wanna I wanna give give a, give a shout out here to um, to the the work we 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 do at Fable. So at Fable we're we're building um we're building a diffusion model on top of the Fable RE framework. And um and we do full H3 back on a side chain design. You can see here it 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 works. It you know we're we're diffusing in the H3 loop quite nicely. Um, we do have a a Fable RE a Fable RE diffusion. We have quite a nice correlation of um of AER of of amino acid recovery rate with RMSD. You can see here when when we do get to very high RMSDs, a very high AAR. So when, when we generate loops that are that look um that that are that are very similar to the to the um to the um um template uh, uh H3 loop, we are we are getting RMSDs in the in the um in the sub in the sub two angstrom range. So we're getting clothing around one angstrom. So so we are we are getting loops with 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 very with very, with very similar com 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 conformation to the crystal, crystal structure. Uh, and then finally, when you when you compare it to to diff app, um, you know diff app actually, and that's that's something that that that, that people who, who don't who don't look at structures very much uh, don't realize. But uh, but 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 more models like diff ab um, generate most of the loops are actually have chain breaks, and that's that's related to the fact that 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 you do the frame diffusion kind of thing, and then you're and then you're you 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 diffusing and you see alphas, but you but you but you can check and the frames don't really match up, so so you're getting some chain breaks. I should mention that most of the chain breaks are fixable quite easily, but 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 it still gives you a little pause if you're if most of your loops with chain breaks. And at Fable diff generate loops with loops without chain breaks are right out of the box. So, so we're generating realistic loops. And then um finally we we are we are doing active learning at Fable. And um and that is um and that is I think quite substantial that that I think is a substantial or material um impact uh, to our models so when we when we do we are able to to uh, to retrain our models based on based on our our, our internal data at least a substantial improvement in, in, in AR in AR for for h3 design and um when we when we do uh, do full h3 design then um with with fable diff we we are we are going to be outperforming other more other models like this by 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 quite by quite a good margin both in AR and on and RMSD. Um okay and then finally we're we're we we are we are we are generating sort of you know real promising binders based on based on sort of early um proof of concept experiments. Okay so um finally I wanna I wanna mention um 
I want to mention something that's that's closer to my heart, and that's that's again for my academic lab. Um, so what? So the next frontier, I believe, and and I think a lot of people, a lot of people agree with me on that. I I hope I think, is um, is dynamics uh, and doing doing dynamics using using machine learning models. And dynamics dynamics are very important uh, also for also for for therapeutically relevant um, relevant um, uh, molecules, so like like peptides. Or CDRH3s or macrocyclic peptides, right? And um, and so what, what we really want to do is get is build build machine learning models that can that can account for dynamics that that, that can that can learn conformational spaces. And so of course, um, as everybody or as almost almost everybody in the audience will will, will be well aware of, is um, is in you know we're there's many decades of work on on conventional sampling based on physics based on physics based methods, right? And so we we have we have we have sort of conventional energy landscape, and we have we have sort of um, um, ways to ways to approximate the, the potential energy, and then we have sort of ways to do to do sampling like 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 ND. Of course, these you know getting visiting all the visiting all these these minima takes it's going to take a lot of time up to up to milliseconds and microseconds based on which based on which which sort of um, which sort of um, 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 transition what we're talking about, and so what, what we want to do to um, to to be able to do that in a design setting is we wanna we want to be able to, to to just learn the to learn the function to learn the conservation energy landscape, and learning the conservation energy landscape effectively means that we wanna we wanna learn a an a distribution a probability distribution or or an energy distribution. Um, and we want to learn a neural network that can transform a, a Gaussian, an isotropic Gaussian, into our target distribution, which is which is a potential energy landscape, right? And so the um, and so so there so there is a there is a bit of there's a bit of work on that, and I think both the generators actually go go way back to to work to work from uh, from um, from um, um, from from Hinton uh, way back in the day. But but now no, there's been a bunch of work in both generators for for Frank Noe, for instance, that is a, that I saw on the schedule to to talk to be talking soon um, in in the same session. Um, and um, so so what we what we, what we wanted to go about is we wanted to build a Boltzmann generator for for therapeutically relevant molecules. And the good thing about a Boltzmann generator in in the, in the setup that, that we do is that we can do we can do training in two phases. We can do we can do training on on training by example on non confirmations. But we also want to want to do generate by energy to compare our likelihood to the Boltzmann distribution, and so that's basically reinforcement learning. And um, and so initially we 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 used continuum normalizing flows because usually usually we, we need invertibility to do to be able to do training by energy, right? And invertibility restricts the um, restricts our use of neural network architectures quite a lot. Basically, any none of the cool none of the cool architectures are invertible. But by be but by using continuous normalizing flows, which which is a which is a cool trick that goes back to David Duvernal here 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 of U of T, we um we 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 don't we don't need to we don't need to use a, an invertible network, and in, instead we instead we, we we use ordinary ordinary differential equations to 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 solve the to solve the network, and so our PEPFLOW our PEPFLOW approach, which um is um so its PEPFLOW is now is now the first PEPFLOW is 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 on Bayer Archive, and um. It's quite a sophisticated approach, I, I, I would say, and that's largely to the to the great to the great effort by 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 a brilliant student, Osama Osama Abdin. Um, so it it consists of first a a, a a hyper network, and so we're and the hyper network learns all the peptide sequence dependence, and so um, basically the way it works is that um, you you drop in a peptide sequence into the hyper network, and it'll predict all the parameters of the, of all of the of the sequence networks. And then we and then the main network is a back is a backbone network that will that will that will come up with the, with the back with all the backbone coordinates of your peptides, and and most notably it it also contains some information about the side chains. So so and, and the most notably we we become, we we encode the side chain centroid, and that that gives you a large portion of information about the side chain already. And then we have a rotomo network that will that, that, that will then solve the solve the, the the rest of the of the of the side chain of the side chain confirmations. And for technical reasons, we 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 need a we need a formation network that 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 put our protons on that we that we get a fully we get a fully qualified qualified structure. 
And so um, the first thing to note is that PepFlow actually does work quite well in generating realistic PepFlow confirmations, so realistic peptide confirmations, and it and it does learn you know what what a peptide looks like in terms of you know bond 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 lengths, bond angles, and and Ramachandran plots quite quite nicely. Um, we we do get we do get you know decent sidechain RMSDs in the in the in the way sub angstrom level. And we and we we do we we do we do regenerate realistic side chains. I'm going to mention here that um, that you know you see a discrepancy here between the generated pep flow in in orange and the um, and the and the ground truth in blue. But um, that's due to this due to this angle of of, of carboxy group. And um, and I would argue that that's a that's a feature, not a bug, because. Um, because so for so for for pep flow right you know these you know these it's you know for, for pep, pep flow knows which way the side chain goes right but um but of course these these oxygens are uh, are chemically you know indistinguishable right so 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 for for, for pep flow you you can do it both ways but it's, in reality it's the same so 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 this, this is actually this is actually a feature on the book. Um, and so we're so we, we we are we are generating um we are generating confirmations that are that are that are that are similar to the molecular dynamic simulations. And um and when we do um when we do when we run PepFlow in a structural prediction manner, we we I would say we edge out. I mean we're we 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 outperform, yes, we outperform alpha fold and yes unfold. The 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 different performance isn't huge. But but we, so we, we do we do better than other folds and, and ESM folds in, in, in a single sort of prediction way in about 55, 56 percent of the cases. So we're we're we are we are we are we are just edge them out. And most most notably, we um we do get a decent coverage of pep of an of NMR ensemble. So we, we cover about 50% or so of, of the structures in the, in the NMR ensemble. And, and the NMR ensemble cover cover most of, of what of what we cover in, in PepFlow. So we so we do PepFlow really does learn uh, conversion ensembles you know reasonably well. Um, you know what what we, what we can now do is we is we can now do we can now perform latent space search to um to get microcyclic peptide conformations. And um and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that we can so we, we did it here for um for head to tail microcycles which which Alpha Volta can actually do. But um, but by by using the, the same methodology, we can we can also do side chain cyclic pep macrocycles for basically any side chain cyclic in chemistry you want to, which is going to be really difficult with with with, with any other method like like alpha fold or 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 R diffusion. And uh, you can you can see here, so we we can predict quite quite nicely um, uh, head head to tail cyclic of microcycle micro conformations or side side chain cyclic macro conformations. And we can use PepFlow in a generative way, um, and um, I'm going to show you here PepFlow plus plus, which will which which is almost hard at work now, and um, and it, it it contains some some new features like um, like we we're we can we can incorporate a pocket encoder, and the pocket encoder is enables us to generate binding peptides directly, and um, and then we're also um, we're we we with now with now you know, as as you all know, um, the field moves incredibly fast, right? And it's it's actually kind of actually kind of funny that that sort of where we become full circle. So, um, PepFlow was initially 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 conceived as a as a continuous normalizing flow network, as as I mentioned. Then diffusion came came along, and we and we ref and we 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 refactored it as a, as, a, as a diffusion model. And now flow is coming back, right, as in the form of of continue of conditional flow matching. And so the and so the newest version of PepFlow is actually is actually both can it can be both as continuous flow matching model and but but actually it turns out the the PFGM the the post flow general model actually performs slightly better so so it's it's a PFGM now and PepFlow plus plus works uh, still works really well at both generating unbound and bound fragments and and also and doing bound fragments with a with with a mass sequence so it's doing doing both fragment generation and sequence generation. I performed quite well at that, and so we're and we're we're getting reasonably bound bound sequence confirmations when when we do it in a when we're doing it in a, in a fully generative way. You can see you can see here we're we're getting LMSDs, you know, around you know one point five angstroms or so in 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 our, in our best cases, and we generate hundred samples. Um, 
Right now, our way of ranking the samples that we that we were with this clustering isn't great, but um, but we but but so we we but we we definitely are when we when we when we get low when we get higher when we get higher cluster numbers where we are getting into the into the LRMSD range of 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 like sub two angstroms. So so I would say pretty pretty decent, and we're we're getting ARs which I don't show here of 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 an, in the in the forty in the forty percent range. So it's, I think it's it's pretty pretty decent. Um, okay, so that, that's it for PepFlow. I want to I, I want to also uh, mention really quickly some some early work we did with flow matching. Um, so we so we so another student of mine is working on, on a torsional flow matching model to do to do such and packing, and I can see here so that so that's our such and packing model, and we're we're, we're doing so we're doing torsional torsional flow matching as I mentioned. So so the the way the way it works is essentially we're we're adapting Riemann flow matching. And we're and then we're doing noise torsions using an equivalent trunk and equivalent grass transformer, and we're and we're doing we're doing a vector field on a torus and and solve and sampling it with with an ODE solver, and we're um so we so we are um flow pack um does I would say reasonably well and we're and we're 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 close competitive with diff pack by being uh by being but but being much much faster than faster than diff pack. Because sampling is much faster with with, with flow matching than with than the most diffusion models, and we will be showing you some examples where we where we're where we're edging out this pack in in instead of, instead of an early sort of an early and early approach. Okay, so finally, finally, um, I want I want to switch gears a bit and talk about um talk about uh, talk about zinc fingers. Um, so I would say the the um um so 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 so. The, so so I've been mainly talking about um, biologics and design of biologics and proteins. Um, that also, of course, uh, RNA-based drugs. But um, what, 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 what I want to what I, what I want to focus on here is doing uh, gene therapy in the sense of in the sense of um, 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 upper regulating upper regulating or down regulating down regulating the expression of genes using transcription factors. That we can that we can target using using zinc fingers or, or other approaches, and that's of course a a, a highly a very um, enticing way to do to do a therapeutic intervention for 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 a whole bunch of things for a whole, whole bunch of whole bunch of whole bunch of diseases. So when so what if we can control the expression level of of any of any gene we we want to, we can do that by reprogramming by reprogramming reprogramming transcription factors. Uh, using using a a a um a suitable DNA targeting uh, domain, and so um and so I'm I'm gonna do a I'm gonna make a quick sh big shout out here to zinc fingers. So zinc fingers, are, of course, if you, if you if you if you remember, they are they were the main approach to DNA targeting before Talens and CRISPR and CRISPR came along. I I'm I will still mention, and that's I think incontroversial. It's something not controversial. Is that CRISPR and CRISPR and Talens have 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 um, drawbacks, and the main thing here is immunogenicity. Also, they're both very large, so so you you can't really fit them, or it's difficult to fit them into A/B vectors. But the main thing is that if you want to do, if you want to apply CRISPR and and Talens in an in vivo fashion, so if you want to inject them into people, you'll always have a problem of immunogenicity, right? They're they're they're, they're bacterial proteins, right? And so bacterial proteins. Your immune system is gonna is gonna is gonna be unhappy if you inject if you inject yourself with with the with bacterial protein. Zinc fingers are human are human proteins, or there's seven thousand zinc fingers in the human in the human genome, and so 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 they so they so they have much lower risk of immunogenicity, and uh, and we also have 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 a bunch of other other advantages like uh, like no PAM and 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 full full engineerability. So the main the main problem with 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 zinc fingers is is that um, and that's also uncontroversial is that it's been very difficult to solve that the problem of which zinc finger binds binds which DNA target, and so the main problem of that is that you zinc fingers bind in arrays usually three or more so so you need six to specify on the human genome, and then um, which zinc finger sits to which other zinc finger matters. In determining specificity, so you, you have that you have that problem here that you have these adjacent zinc fingers in, in influence each other, and so they, they influence how they how they sit in the major groove, and and then how they how they actually bind to your bind to the DNA, 
and so that's and so one of my collaborators had 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 a had a animation um made for this so basically so so this thing this thing this, this yellow finger and the blue finger they, they don't like to play with each other so this this yellow finger and the red finger don't like to play with each other and this and but 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 if you, if you search for long enough this yellow finger and the green finger they play with each other and then and then you get the, and then you get a real binder but um solving this which link fingers like to play with each other has been an unsolved problem in the in the zinc finger field for 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 decades really, and that's really the main reason that that uh, the main reason that the CRISPR took over, and so um um so we 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 took an approach that that combined AI or machine learning and large scale screening to solve this problem, and um so essentially Marcus Noyes at MYU he they, they did a large scale screen of of doing both Single finger libraries and and adjacent finger libraries and and did and did lots of these and he, he always mentioned that there's there's uh, there's five billion data points in, in 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 his in his in his library screens and what we did in my lab and what again what Obama did in my lab is build a, a a custom built transformer model so I think this this is the first hierarchical transformer um, that we built um, to to solve this problem. And, it, and the transformer architecture is, is actually very well very well adapted to this problem because it's it's a translation problem right so you so you start with a you start with, with a DNA target actually with two DNA targets and you and you want to and you want to solve the for the for the for the amino acid zinc fingers that will bind there and um and the way it works here is the, the lower transformer module solves the single finger problem. And this upper this upper hierarchy module solves the solves the compatibility problem, and so um and so by 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 essentially doing this and training this on on all on all, on all of Marx's zinc finger data, we were able to come up with with this transform model where you simply drop in your you simply drop in your your, your DNA target sequence and out pop your 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 DNA your zinc finger your zinc finger sequence data that that will that, that will bind this particular target sequence. And so, um, and so we, we can show that we, that it works really well. So we we all perform basically anything that's been has been there before by, by a very wide margin, as you can see here. Most notably, when we when we first apply this in a in a zinc finger nuclease setting, um, then you can see that that pretty much all the zinc fingers that we design work. So ninety five percent of our zinc fingers design will perform a buff background and cutting somewhere. And about one quarter of our designs are uh, work very very well, and that's that's about that's about uh, the rate that would with, that you'd be shooting at CRISPR at least a few years ago when when we first did the work uh, with with the CRISPR CRISPR guide RNAs. So um, so so the so the the the, the ML approach works works really well. So and we're we're basically we're basically competitive now with with CRISPR in generating zinc fingers that that binds that bind somewhere. And now we can use this for repro and transcription factors. So, so we, we have a, as I said, seven thousand, I think seven thousand zinc fingers in the human in the human genome. Most of these are in transcription factors. We can use any transcription factor. We can replace zinc fingers with the ones we design, and we can we can do that here. And here in reporter assays, we can we can, we can design both a, both an activator and, and a repressor, and get get repression and activation very very nicely. Um, in most cases, more efficiently than 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 than, than Cas9, and uh, and just as just as good as the as the tetra presser that that that, is, that things came from. Um, we can we, we can also repress and, and activate um, um, clinically relevant targets like 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 alpha synuclein for for Parkinson's or CC or CDKN1. And um, uh, right, okay, and that's that's all right, and that's all I had. So, uh, but just want to, want to acknowledge my lab. So my my, my wet lab has been shrinking, and and uh, my funding, and both um and both these stuff is, is going to be is commercialized and Fable and TBG Therapeutics, and I'll thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, see if we have any questions, or if I should start. I need I need to look at. Well, if someone has a question, just to raise your hand or. I can start. I mean, I, I will think about your uh, dynamics questions and uh, how 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 
I mean, you only need a peptide. So the, I guess the, the, it's a really limited size that you can't do things that are really complicated folding things like that. So like, how, how would you challenge to get to dynamics of proteins when things that are really are, I mean, where you can't like, you can you walk into heat of space as one. Well. It's like, do you yeah. see any? Yeah, so the, I think the main the main problem for Peplo, I mean, is that um, so we're we're sort of we're sort of limited by effectively computational resources, right? So um, so I, I can I can give you I can give you sort of uh, uh, the numbers just 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 so you have some flavor of that. Um, so we limited Peplo to peptides of length fifteen, and with the resources we're given, essentially, so with the with the publicly available um, GPU resource that we have in Canada. So we're so we're so we're so the best we can get is is a single A one hundred or maybe two A one hundreds and and on that training Peplow took about um took about uh, a month so if we if so if we if we if we scaled it we we could probably scale it um in, you know maybe up to twenty twenty five residues right and then and then we could and then we could we then we we could we could train it for 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 a bit longer and and, and would probably it would probably still work um but but I think I think effectively um. You know, you 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 could you could you could well imagine um scaling a PEPFLOW like model that is that it can do at least small proteins, right? And and I I do think a PEPFLOW like approach would work for um for let's say small disorder proteins, right? Um, I mean, I, and and uh, and I mean, I I do think now there's there is um there's sort of more lightweight um um equivariant. Models, like very transformer models out there, or not transformer, but actually, very model out there that, uh, that 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 it could use to to scale it to scale it more. I mean, so PepFlow is already using, I would say, one of the most lightweight um um, um equivariant transformers, so it's the EGNNs, right? Equivariant graph neural networks, the EGNNs. Um, but uh, so so I think to to for, to do larger proteins, I think it's, it's mainly a scaling thing. I I do think in general the pro the approach would work fine for proteins up to for proteins, but uh, we're, 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 we just have the issue of scaling. But but doesn't the equivalent model need to be like physically coherent? Like I mean, if you took an alpha fold like model, it does. I mean, it breaks down the peptide bonds, whatever. So that I guess you would need to have something that is physically correct, or is, isn't that a problem? You know, you know, for, for for sure. But but I mean, but I mean, so you. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you know, I, I would, I would strong, I would strongly assume that for that, that you know, for at least for small proteins, uh, there would, there would be enough training data that, that, okay. that, that, and, and so the other thing is that for, for a PEPFLOW like approach, right, um, you can, you can always train it, train it on, on MD, and then you can always train it by, 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 by reinforcement learning, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so, so you, so I, I'm. I'm quite sure. I'm, I think this is being recorded, so, so I, I, I have to I have to watch out what I say. But I'm, I'm quite sure that with enough scaling, it it, it, it would work for for small okay. protein. Great. Okay. Okay. Shoshana, has a question. Yeah, I had like a question concerning the zinc fingers. Uh, do you have have you looked into the uh, what is really governing the compatibility between uh, zinc finger binding between? You're, you're looking at pairs. That's one thing. So what governs the compatibility between pairs and is the pairwise compatibility enough to give you a result of if you have a larger number of, of binding zinc fingers, which All right. Right. So that's a great question. So um so um um so in the in the in the in the published version, so we we do we do pairs and then we do uh and then um then we introduce a a linker between the pairs. That that decouples the pairs, right? So that so that, that that that's sort of a trick, right? So so you can do you can you can you can do you can you can you can essentially a six a six finger a six finger array is basically three pairs that are, that are independent from each other, but that, that has that has some disadvantages because um because you introduce essentially more more off target binding because 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 each pair will be able to bind to bind independently, right? Um, but so in the in the in the next in the next version, and we're we're actually we're actually about to about to about to uh, submit a paper on that. Is um, so natural zinc fingers don't do that. What right? natural zinc fingers um, have, you know, have have interconnected zinc fingers of of of, of essentially you know variable lengths. Mm -hmm. And um, what what you, what we can show is that with 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 a very similar ML model, we can simply solve for mutual pairwise compatibility. 
right? So you so mm -hmm. you, you have a pair A B C D E F, and you solve can solve for that uh, that that A and B B and C D and E and E and F are are, are compatible. It's it's just it's just a matter of sampling, and we and we we have we have plenty we have we have we have plenty we have lots and lots of data to show that that it works. And that and that these um, interconnected zinc fingers are, are in fact you know better solutions than 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 these than these than these than these pairwise zinc fingers. And how how general are uh, are these uh, uh, I would say these bindings in terms of you know with with if it would bind to different different uh, regions of the genome different genes is the actual you know DNA you know DNA target uh, a problem. So, um, so in so over the past couple of years, so this work has been going on for 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 for, for quite some time now. I I don't recall. I I, I don't recall. I think that there have been maybe a couple, but but I don't really recall any targets that we couldn't do. So there there's been. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, there's, okay. So it, it's 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 been probably a, a let's let me let's say a a double digit uh, a high double digit number of targets, and 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 and, mm -hmm. and, and I think we're, we're, we we okay. get to all of them. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Where well, I'll keep on asking. Uh, I mean, I, I was just thinking about the, the slide that you have up now. That you have one person in the wet lab and this eight people in the dry lab. Is that person extremely productive? Because it's normally <laughs> I think people, people people have it normally the other way around. It's like, <laughs> or is it, are these wet lab experiments so easy? Right. Okay. I guess it's. I mean, yeah. So, so I think so. That that's that's mainly been sort of a thing of um of um of my personal focus, right? So, so I I used to have, the split used to be about um about one third one third two thirds, right? There, there, there used to be about five. There was, I think I think the largest my wet lab was 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 five people, and then 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 there, then there were about like ten, eleven wet dry lab people, dry lab people, right? So so there there was a more more of a more of more sort of of, of a critical mass in the, in the wet lab. Um, I think my, my personal focus has, has just been much more on sort of the um, on sort of the the the, the ML develop and ML methodology development, right? And so 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 we well, I, I do very much I do very much want to keep dry lab in house, so so we, we we can we can do all our own validations. But um, but you know I'm 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 getting increasingly busy, so uh, so so there so there so there's that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's hard to run a wet lab with too few people, and it's like, yes. and yeah, and, Emma, just, uh, you, you need some continuity there. Okay, Emma, I, 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 I would assume there are more questions. If not, like, yeah, I think, um, it's, it's Shoshana, yeah, Shoshana I, I again. Like, another question, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in, for the design of your CDR H3 or CDR loops, do you have enough data? I mean, how how do you what kind of data do you use for that? That's <laughs> one of the huge, you know, very huge problems in this in this area. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so as I mentioned, so so we're 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 definitely we're definitely in, in a data poor regime, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. so there's so 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 there's the depending depending on how depending on how strict you you put your redundancy cutoff, but but there's if you put a loose redundancy cutoff there, there's about twenty five hundred. Um, crystals antibody crystal fraction in, in the PDB, right? So that that's that's not a huge amount of data to to train on. I mean, so there are, but but I mean, so so there so so there are there are ways to do to do transfer learning, and there are, there are ways to do to 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 use more data, right? Um, but but uh, but I would definitely say that we are data limited. But um, yeah, as as I mentioned, right? So we're so with with all these sort of you know data. Data augmentation and they, and trend and, and other strategies that we have and, and making use of, of active learning, we we can we I believe we we are not in a position where we where we where we can design reasonably decent H three loops for uh, for 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 a given epitope. And what about this prediction of the structures? So um I I think and I've been saying that for a long time I think structure prediction is um is fundamentally a bit more difficult. Simply because, simply because you 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 have to, simply because you, just, your solution space is is is, is small. The right? solution space is one. Yeah. Is, is 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 measure of one, right? So when you when you do design, you, you can basically design what you want to, right? When and 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 so right. 
And so there, there are ways, there are things that are going to be better designing than, than others, right? Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. if you pick a structure, you, you are, you are given, you're given the thing you have to predict and then, and then, and then you have to do well on it, right? Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. I think we are running out of questions. So maybe we have to thank uh, Philip again. And uh, I mean, I was, it was a lot. I think we all, we all have had to go back and look at a lot, lot of papers. It's like, <laughs> it's like it's nice. And uh, I, I know I will meet you soon anyway, like in the meeting. Oh, yes. But it's, uh, uh, right. and you should come to Casp. You should come to Casp. It's like, 